This is Duke University. I first met Stefan, actually this is sort of embarrassing, but 30 years ago, when we both had a lot more hair, and Stefan was visiting. He was a graduate student at the time at the Stockholm School of Economics, and eventually went on, completed his PhD there, but he was visiting at Princeton at the time. And actually, I won't, I won't tell the story because it reflects badly on me, not Stefan, of, of how we met. Stefan went on to become a lecturer in economics at the Stockholm School, and then <clears throat> joined the, did a, a whole bunch of important things in, in the Swedish um, government financial sector. The key was that um, in between 1988 and 1992, he was undersecretary for financial markets and institutions with the Swedish Ministry of Finance. And that might sound like an important but not riveting position, except that that was a period when the Swedish um, government decided that it was going to peg its exchange rate. And I won't go on at length, but that led to a financial crisis and it fell to Stefan to take care of that, which he did remarkably successfully. And as because of that, he was made deputy, deputy governor of the Riksbank and then was appointed director of the international, one of the directors of the International Monetary Fund from 1999 through 2005. He then abandoned the IMF to return to Sweden, where he's been serving since then as um, head of their central bank, the Riksbank. Today he's going to be talking on monetary policy and, um, and what to do with, with um, when banks get in trouble. Stefan, welcome to Duke. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, uh, for me, it's nice to be back. I have no pedagogical training at all. First time I gave a lecture, it was the same number of people. I asked my professor, what should I do? Because I was horrified. And he says, you have to go there and talk to them. And that I did, and I've been talking, talking since. Uh, today I'm going to talk about monetary policy, and it basically it's sort of almost three, le three lectures in one. I don't have to, the time, time to cover all the ground that, that I have in, in, on the slides. This is basically dealing with issues that I deal with in one form or the other daily. This happens to be the Swedish central bank, but basically all I'm talking about is very, very general. So this could hold for almost any central bank, wherever you happen to be in the, in the, in, in the world. I'm going to talk about inflation targeting and what it means to operate a central bank with an inflation target. I'm going to only say a couple of words about what happens in the engine room when you actually run a central bank, because we don't have time to get into the details. And I'm going to talk about what happens under the present circumstances when you have all sorts of uh, financial troubles in, in various parts of the world and what that, that does to, to uh, conducting, conducting monetary, monetary policy. So, uh, Fasten your seat belts, uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy. We we'll hope that, that this will, you'll find this uh, interesting. So first part, monetary policy implementation with an inflation, with an inflation target. Uh, this is not only theory. Actually, when you do these things, it's almost always necessary when you deal with things in real life to also have some, some sort of institutional no knowledge about what is going on. Because actually, how you, how you build institutions affects how you decide, which is sometimes quite, quite often completely forgotten. And to make a very, very long story short, uh, starting out 1668, this is the oldest central bank in the world. And it, also, it came out of a banking crisis back in 1669, 61. So in that sense, there is nothing new under the sun. And 16, since 1668, we have tried almost everything imaginable. Some, some of these things don't work at all. Some of them do work. And today, I'm mostly going to talk about stuff that works. Uh, the other point in, uh, that one needs to remember is the one 1999 when the uh, central bank became independent, which is, which is an issue in itself because in many, many parts of the world 
uh, central banking is sort of quite politicized, uh, and that is not the case in, in, in my case, but it's been a long story getting to where we are. A bit, little bit more of in the institutional setup. Uh, what is very, very unusual is that the central bank is an independent authority under parliament. In most countries, actually, the central bank is an authority under the Ministry of Finance. And it has been like that all, all, the, all, the, all the way since 1668. And I th think maybe for one simple reason, because the parliament of that day felt, did not feel comfortable with, with having the central bank under the king. And for hundreds of years, the debate has always been who is going to have the right to get the money. And that's a basic issue which never goes away, and that's still, that is still with us. Then we have the supervisors, uh, the FSA, and the National Debt Office under the Ministry of Finance. This is actually one of the most decentralized uh, <coughs> structures you can find in the world when it comes to running things in the financial sector or on the public sector, on the public sector side. So this is institutionally quite, quite unusual, but it's easy to figure out who is responsible for what in this, in this technical setup. So, fiscal policy, that's up to Parliament and the government to deal with, and it's up to the central bank to deal with the monetary, monetary policy. That's the basic, basic setup that we, that we deal with. And since we are a, an authority under Parliament, we have a general council with 11 members, and then the executive board with six members. And this is what we look like. Uh, all of us have actually uh, dealt with either financial sector issues or macro policies for years. Uh, we're, and, and some of you may recognize Professor Lars Svensson, who is one, one, of, one of the leading experts in the world when it comes to dealing with inflation targeting from a theoretical point of view. So, what is it that we're supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to safeguard the value of money, which we have interpreted to be price stability. And we're supposed to prom promote a safe and efficient payment, uh, payment system. Uh, and, and, and these are sort of, this is very general, general statements in the law, and it's pretty much up to us who operate the central bank daily to give this a content, something, something to, something to uh, do. And it's, by the way, a lot easier to deal with price stability in terms of what we're supposed to do compared to promote a safe and efficient payment system, because that's much, much harder to, to define. The short version of the latter is basically to say is part of our job is to make sure that the financial sector doesn't fall apart. Unfortunately, sometimes it happens anyway. Uh, and I've done a lot of that work, but that's, that's, a, different, that's a different lecture. That's not for, uh, for today. If you look at this chart, you can see here that uh, back in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, this is the, the blue line is the average, average inflation rate. It was around 8.3%. 8 Bad. Then after changing the monetary regime completely and after having a huge macroeconomic imbalance and all sorts of problems in the economy, uh, an inflation uh, target was put in place back in 1993 and we've had it like that since then. And then the mean inflation rate, the blue line down here, is 1.6%. So in that sense we have actually been reasonably, reasonably su uh, successful. And, 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 uh, in, so uh, inflation targeting uh, is something that seems to, seems to work, at least, at least so far. This is another way of describing what happens when you move between two different monetary policy regimes. If you look at the dotted line, that's when we abandoned the peg, when the Swedish krona was pegged. Before that, you can see the blue line, the, that the currency doesn't move very much, but the interest rate jumps up and, up and down. Here, from then on, you can see that the currency moves quite a lot, not to say what, it, what has happened in the past uh, six months. While on the other hand, interest rates have come down and be, been very, very stable. Uh, and, and here you have a choice. I mean, this is the way it's going to look depending on what kind of monetary regime you have, you have chosen. chosen. But, but you can't peg both. I mean, that will, that will, never, that will never work. So after 1999, price stability, a, a general council which is appointed for four years and an executive board appointed for six years. And the way we are appointed, if you compare to, to uh, what it, the way it works in this country, during that six year period, uh, you cannot be fired. Uh, so in that sense, uh, all the six of us are truly independent. And that's, of course, for that reason, there's quite a debate before you are appointed who is going to be appointed next and all the, all the, rest, of, all, all the rest of it. 
The way this is set up is, is given that I'm the chairperson, I have the casting vote. So essentially, I need two, two more persons on my side, and that's the way it's going to end up. Mostly, we have a consensus, but a few times, uh, it's been up to me to, to decide. And then, of course, if that happens, uh, uh, there's quite a, quite a sort of a uh, discussion in the media about what was going on. I'll skip that one and, and get to monetary policy and why price stability is a reasonable, re reasonable thing to, to aim for. Well, first of all, monetary policy cannot affect employment in the long run. The, we're talking about a monetary phenomenon, not really the real economy. To use a price, uh, an inflation target is, in, is important because that's one way of establishing inflation expectations. If you say inflation is going to be 2% and over time people actually start believing in it, that's highly, highly helpful and, and, and good. Also, if you have a high and fluctuating inflation that increases uncertainty and it, fact, if it affects investments and it's quite likely that that will uh, reduce growth in the e economy. And it's very costly to hold back inflation once inflation has gotten out of hand. And in, in, in the really worst cases, basically ultimately at the end of the day you end up changing currency. And one such example, which is uh, very far from where the Riks Bank is today, is in Zimbabwe, where they have a hyper, hyperinflation. And high inflation leads to very sizable redistribution of income and wealth in the economy, and very often in a, such a way that, that the, the wealthy people are the first ones who understand what happens. And they, they sort of adjust to that, while people, low income uh, people, don't understand until it's too late what is going on. And that's highly detrimental to the way the economy works and to, to, to growth. Finally, if you have one instrument, there is one simple rule, one target. It's very hard to hit two nails with one hammer. So that's why you have to choose either the rate of interest or the exchange rate. But you just cannot do both. Many have tried, and it doesn't work. This, is, this, this graph shows inflation expectations uh, by uh, money market agents because we, we ask people, what do you think the inflation, inflation rate is going to be in the future? And if you look at the gray lines, uh, if you look at, uh, let's say, around 1998, here, people had the bad, still remember the bad years. And regardless of what we did, they always said inflation is going to go up. Slowly, slowly, they figured out that these guys are actually serious about getting inflation down. So this is where we are today. And here you can see, almost regardless of what's going on with the actual inflation rate, uh, people think that inflation, the inflation three to five years out is actually going to end up uh, being around 2%. And that's nice. That's very, very nice. And then, since we say we cannot make the inflation, we, can meet, we cannot meet the target tomorrow, and most of the time, we're actually be, going to be off target in one way or the other. And the reason for that is that when, you, when interest rates go up and down, it doesn't affect everything in the economy immediately. And that's because there is uncertainty over the transmission mechanism, how, how these things actually feed through the economy, ultimately to the price, uh, to price changes. And also, sometimes uh, we want to reduce fluctuations in the real economy. It would, sometimes it would be too costly to force the inflation rate down immediately, and that would produce very large swings in the real economy, uh, which causes, uh, among other things, unemployment in the short run to go up and down. And it's costly to deal with that. So how do we do this? We have six monetary policy meetings a year. Uh, we write three monetary policy reports. We have three updated assessments, and I show up in Parliament twice a year uh, talking about this for two to three hours. All of this is on our web page if you want to check and see what it, uh, what it, uh, what it looks like. We had an updated assessment uh, last week uh, that we published, uh, and, and uh, I'll, I'll get into that, that this is what we did. This red graph shows the repo rate, which is sort of our in policy rate, and how it has moved in the last few years. And as you can see here, it dropped from 475 down to uh, half a percent, 0 point, 0.5. What is very unusual among central banks, as far as I know, there are only four central banks in the world that do this, and we are one of them. It's the Bank of New Zealand, Bank of England, Bank of Norway, and us. We publish a graph 
saying that what our interest rate forecast is. And that's very, very rare. And in mostly in other central banks, they say that bad things happen to you if you, tell, if you tell people what you think about the future. I say, so be it, but part of my job is to tell people what I think about the future. And that is why we publish this, uh, this graph. This is a probability distribution around this graph because if you look at this as the mean, it's actually highly unlikely that you would sort of hit the mean right on. So one should think about this more in terms of the probability distribution than the mean as such. But not the least, given the way uh, the media works, people almost uh, entirely focus on, the, focus on the mean because it's easier to talk about that. It's hard for the general public to argue about probability distributions. That's, that's, essentially, that's essentially why. Now, given that the interest rate is so low, this is also a truncated distribution because we just simply don't how, know how to deal with negative interest rates. We haven't gotten to that chapter in the textbook yet. And, 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 and we had to lower rates before we figured it out. So we have just truncated the, 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 the probability distribution. Uh, this is what we expect to happen with the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. As you can see here, uh, it drops very, very quickly. And this is uh, something which is very similar to many other countries in the world. Our CPI actually in includes uh, interest payments on mortgages. And when the rate of interest has dropped from 4.75 to half a percent, part of it is actually included in, in the CPI. And in that sense, in a technical sense, you could argue that we end up chasing our own tail. Uh, but in the long run, these changes sort of even out. So in the long run, it doesn't really matter. This is what we expect to happen. Prices going down, being on the minus side for a short while, and then gradually rising prices. And given during this period, we start raising interest rates again. Uh, and that, then those interest rate changes get included in the CPI. And that's why it's going to hit uh, peak at around 4, 4, 4 But once we stop once we stop raising interest rates, it'll go back actually uh, to, towards 2%. And this is what we expect to happen with GDP. Uh, also, we are uh, in a recession. Growth is going to be markedly on the minus side this year, and then slowly growth comes back. This actually, this type of a graph you can today uh, draw for many countries, in, many countries in the world, particularly small open export oriented uh, economies. Another way of looking at it is to, to uh, put a, a bit of math on here on, this, on, on the screen. And this is not to scare people away. This is only to illustrate what this is all about. Because another way of thinking about this is to say, OK, what was it that I, that I showed earlier on those graphs? Basically, I said that if the inflation target is 2%, if the infl actual inflation rate deviates from 2%, that's something negative. This is, uh, if this is the average growth rate in the economy, if the actual growth rate deviates from, uh, from the desired uh, growth rate or the, this, the desired average growth rate, that's bad. So essentially what you try to do uh, with the rate of interest setting the inflation target is to minimize uh, these deviations uh, from inflation and output. Then it's a value judgment, which is the lambda, to what extent you care about deviations in output at all, or if you only look at the inflation rate. So if lambda is zero, then you say, I don't care what happens in the real economy. I only care about the inflation rate, meeting the inflation target. And if the lambda is a very large number, then you say what really matters is the real economy, not so much the inflation rate. And then that's another way of sort of expressing what's behind <coughs> those graphs that I, that I showed. And I can, this is just another way of expressing the same thing. <coughs> now, if you put up the graphs in, in deviation terms, then what this is all about is that here you can see the red graph. And the dotted line here shows the deviation from the desired 2% inflation rate. So in terms of thinking about this in, in terms of the loss, those deviations one would, would like to minimize, while at the same time, the blue line shows the deviations in GDP under here. And as you can see, this is sort of very, very much on the negative side. And then what monetary policy is all about 
to weigh those two deviations together in such a way that uh, we reach the inflation target over, let's say, two to, three, two to three years. Another way of thinking about this is, is basically to say that output, sorry, output is a function of uh, technology, capital, hours worked, and total hours worked is a function of average hour worked plus uh, the size of the labor supply. And that means that you can, you can with a few, making a few changes here, you can say that output is a function of all of, all of this, <coughs> included uh, labor and hours, uh, hours worked. And that means that you can estimate these gaps either in GDP terms, in our hours work terms, or in unemployment terms. And that's just another way of describing the pretty much one and the same thing in three different, three different ways. And when you do that, what is, what is interesting here is, first of all, is how closely these curves are actually tracking each other. But secondly, which is, which is interesting in itself, is that if you look at the red dotted line here, which is the deviation in GDP, then you can see that hours worked and employment, uh, they reach, reach their minima later. And that's because the way the labor market works, unemployment is going to continue the way we look at it all the way until the beginning of 2011. And that's because the labor market is lagging behind what is going on in the rest of the economy. And that means that once you, once you take a hit the way we have done due to a very, very large fall in exports, it's going to actually take a number of years before you can restore that uh, equilibrium in one way or the other. How do we do this in addition? Well, we signal, uh, we signal what we think in the monetary policy reports. Uh, we do policy rates and we do policy rate forecasts. And it's the forecasting part which is rather unusual. We publish the minutes from the monetary policy meetings. And we publish the minutes with a two-week lag, which is very rare, and with attribution. So you know actually who said what. And that's always then, of course, discussed in the, in, the, in, in the media, what these various views are. And the next set of minutes will be published uh, some, sometime around the 7th of May or something like that. So then you can look it up and see what we said when we came to the conclusion that we had to lower the interest rate to half a, per half, half, half a percent. This whole business about uh, publishing minutes is also in the central banking community a hot issue. Uh, and it has been discussed actually for years whether one should do it this way or that way or not do it at all. Uh, the ECB does it with a 25 or, 25 or 30 year lag. So in that sense, we are at one extreme end of the spectrum and they are at the other, the other end. It's hard to tell which, one, which method is the best one to, uh, to do it. And we give a huge number of speeches, you know, all the, all, all the six, six of us in various parts of the, uh, of the economy and in the country and nowadays also actually we go to London and New York and some other places where major investors who follow what's going on in, in the Swedish economy want to listen to what we have to say. This is how the policy, the, how the three month treasury bill rate is tracking the repo rate. And that's, that's really what monetary policy is all about. So here you can see how closely these two follow each other, except down here. And here, this is the last six months when everything in the whole world ended up uh, being quite difficult to deal with. So the tracking is off track. That's one way of explaining it uh, presently. But over time, as you can see, uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty good when it comes to what we try to achieve when we, when we do, this, do these things. So in summary, we are an authority under the parliament. Uh, we think that reasonably low in inflation is a good thing for the economy as a whole. So we have a 2% inflation target, plus minus 1%. Uh, and the repo rate achieved their full impact on the economy as a whole after one to two years. And we've been independent since 1999. And we truly, truly believe in openness. Uh, and we think that that's an efficient tool that creates uh, legitimacy. Uh, when you do these things. Because personally, I do believe that with independence also goes, uh, has to go transparency. Because if people can't fire you, they need to understand what you're doing. 
Uh, that's really the, the short, short uh, version, version of this. And our ambition at the Riksbank has been to be among the most transparent central banks in the world. And I do think that that, that holds uh, as, of, as of today. Whether that is right or wrong, history will tell. Uh, that's, that's for others to decide later, but that's how we actually go about, go about uh, doing, doing this. Now, uh, let me pretty much skip the, the middle section of my speech, so I'm going to go very fast through a number of uh, slides here. Uh, but let me make one point, though. When you study macroeconomics, and when you struggle with your textbooks and study for your exams, most of you are going to, or tend to, or because no one told you so, talk, uh, thought about it, most of you are going to skip how you actually do these things. What it takes to run a central bank. Because to most of you, particularly when you do the math, that's called a transaction cost, transactions cost, and you ignore it. And in that sense, I'm a transactions cost. But I make a living out of it, so it's OK for me. Uh, it really pays at some stage of your professional lives if you are interested in macroeconomics, to uh, do a bit of sort of hands-on studying what you actually do when you run a central bank. Because if you end up dealing with real life issues, you're going to have to struggle with that sooner or later. Uh, and that's why, despite the fact, because time does not allow me to do that, I'm going to skip some slides. It really pays to, to, to pay attention to it, despite the fact that that stuff almost never shows up in textbooks. And te but textbooks have so many pages anyway, so, so one, has to, one has to choose. So, monetary policy implementation. Basically, and forget what, what it says up there. Basically, what this game is all about is that because a central bank has a national monopoly on producing a good called money, and money is actually like any other good. If you, if you produce lots of it, the price goes down. And if it, it's harder to find, the price goes up. And the name of the game when it comes to operating monetary policy using the balance sheet of the central bank is either to work on the price side by setting the price of money, and then the quantity, quantity, quantity Quantity of money ends up being what it is, because that's endogenous. And people get as much money as they like, given the price, given what it costs to get it. Or you do it the other way around. You set the quantity of money, and then the price is determined in the market. All this technical stuff is basically how you actually, in the daily running of the business, go about doing, doing that. But at the end of the day, it's actually quite similar to going to the farmer's market, arguing about the price of apples. But it takes a while to sort of uh, figure it, figuring out that that's actually how it, how it works. This is another way of showing what I showed you earlier about the, the policy rates, because we also have a deposit rate, the, the yellow line, and we have a, a lending rate, the blue line, and then the, uh, the gray line, which is hard to see here, is, is uh, that one there, in, here in the middle. And that lending rate, that's the rate the banks use when they borrow and lend money among themselves. And we can determine that rate because the banks always have a choice between either to do this among themselves or come to us. That's basically the, the, how, this, how, how this system operates. And then there's a lot of technical, technical stuff to actually, actually make, that, make that happen. Uh, So let's move to where we are today. The monetary policy landscape in a financial crisis, because that's what, what this, is, this is all about. And part of it I showed already, uh, uh, arguing about how we came to the conclusion that the interest rate should be half a percent, and what we think is going to happen to the inflation rate and, the, uh, and, and growth in the Swedish economy. Now let me add a few twists to this because what I started out talking about was kind of the clean version, the nice version about how, you, how we describe what we, what we do. And describe this uh, when, 
against the background of what's going on in the financial sector in the Swedish economy and in uh, various other, other parts of, of, of the world. This is it. Uh, this is a painting by a painter called Turner. It's from the, I think, 1830s or something like that. It's called Steamboat in a Snowstorm. And to some extent, this is what monetary policy is also about presently, because it's stormy and it's foggy out there. And that means that the normal tools that we use don't work as, as, as well as we'd like them to work presently. So this is one, one way of sort of thinking, thinking about that. And I'm going to talk to you here about the macroeconomic landscape. Why is it that it made sense, at least the way I thought about it and my staff thought about it? What is it in the macroeconomic landscape that has caused this? What is it in the financial landscape uh, that we have to deal with presently? And what is there in the regulatory landscape that might need to be changed a bit in order to make things work better in the, in the future? So that's what I'm... That's what I'm going to talk about, and all of it is sort of against the backdrop of what, you just, what I just showed you before when it comes to the general level of interest, rate, interest rates in the country, which is very, very low. Actually, it's as low as it, I think it's almost ever, ever been. So we have two, two, two issues to deal with in this storm. One is the inflation target, and the other one is uh, financial stability or stability in the payment, payment system. And normally, when you talk about monetary policy, you ne almost never get into the, the other one, stability in the payment system. But now we are actually uh, presently in a world where it matters how the latter one actually, act actually works or, or does not work. And the background to this is, is the, uh, uh, the, the, the macro landscape. We have all the global uh, imbalances that were built up over a long period of time. Uh, we had very large uh, current account surpluses in the East, read China, and a number of other countries in Asia, and, and Sweden also for that matter, I'll get to that. And we have had very large current account deficits in the West, uh, read the US. In order to uh, keep this going, there were very large capital flows uh, and an expansionary monetary policy pushed down interest rates basically all over the world. Uh, in terms of looking at current account surpluses and deficits, and I'm happy to show this picture because given my age, I grew up when Sweden always had endless problems with the current account. <laughs> this time we have actually been running a current account surplus for years, which is very, very surprising. So I just figured I'd show it to you. <laughs> Whether it's a good thing or... From a, whether from a macroeconomic perspective it's a good thing or not such a good thing, we can argue about that. But it would never look like that when I went to school. Uh, then the other part of it is, as you can see here, China. And here we're, of course, talking about two, two economies of completely different size and, and the U.S. And this, this thing here has to, the distance between minus six and zero actually has to be financed. That has to be financed one way or the other, and that means that somebody in the U.S. has to issue financial instruments, paper, that somebody else is willing to hold in the, in the, rest, in, in the rest of the world. And that's an issue all, all, all in itself, because if people don't want to do that anymore, uh, then, uh, then, then things start happening in the world economy. And as you can see, this has been going on for many, many years, and that means that people for years have said, this cannot last while at the same time it has been incredibly hard to figure out, well, then, then what? Which day is it not going to last anymore? Because it's been lasting for quite a while. And now, as you can see here, the, there's a slight kink here. So, so actually, uh, this, is, this is presently going in, in a direction where it's quite likely, actually, that the US uh, current account deficit is going to go, go down. Because basically, given what is going on in this economy, uh, demand for goods, and goods uh, imported goods is, 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 uh, is falling. So what, did, what happened? Well, low interest, le interest rates led to a hunt for investments with higher returns. People borrowed a lot. And you had a sharp increase in asset prices and extremely low risk premium. 
And on top of that, uh, many invented many new uh, financial instruments. And also the banks invented a lot of new sort of special tools and companies that were off the balance sheets of the banks until they ran into trouble and um, they had to bring this all to the balance sheets of the banks again. So we had, uh, we created a financial world which was pretty hard to understand and uh, which has proven pretty hard to disentangle uh, when, you, uh, when, when you run into, run into trouble. This is one way of describing this. This can, be, by the way, be described in many, many different, different ways. If you look at credit spreads between, uh, between uh, government bonds and corporate bonds, just look at the yellow line showing uh, high yield bonds, how the spreads go up to uh, 2,000 basis points. And also here you have very low spreads, but, and then this sort of also starts moving, moving around in a way that, that's not so desirable. On the other hand, for, for actually quite a number of years, people said that these spreads are actually too low. This is, not, this is not an equilibrium. This is not likely to last. But when the whole system would start moving out of where it was to another equilibrium, that was, of course, very hard to tell, and it happened quite, uh, quite quickly. So, a co very complicated structure made it difficult to fully understand what was, what was going on. Uh, there was much uncertainty over where the risks were. And uh, fears, really fears, fear caused trade to come to a halt in many markets. And many, many banks experienced great difficulties in refining, financing themselves. And then finally, when Lehman Brothers went under, because all, before that, we were not really touched all that much by this. But when Lehman Brothers uh, fell apart, then something happened in the rest of the world. Now, one should be careful here, though, because it, it's only up to the historians to figure out whether it was Lehman Brothers, or the sunspots, or the moon, or something else that made it happen at that particular day. And that will take many, many years to, to figure out. So presently, on the surface, it appears that it was the Lehman Brothers event. But it might as well have been the sum of bad things going on that all of a sudden sort of coalesced into, in, into this. And there were also fundamental fa failures in risk management. And the bank's uh, incentives to monitor credit risk partly disappeared. And the credit rating agencies' models uh, simply were not good enough for dealing with, with this. And in a technical sense, many correlations were underestimated. Another way of explaining this, because this is sort of the technical versions of it, is to say the following, which I have seen many times, unfortunately, too many times during my professional life and in various parts of the world. And that it's the following statement. Markets tend to function the worst when you need them the most. And if you forget that, you are in trouble. And many forgot about that this time. And that's why many are in trouble. Because if you take on a risky position, thinking that you can trade out of that position in 15 minutes, and all of a sudden it takes you 15 months to trade out of the, that position, then you realize that you are in trouble. So what appears to be an asset which appears to be liquid in good times is not necessarily liquid in bad times. And it's very hard for models to include that feature because models normally are based on normal times. Uh, and that's, that's why you get this. There were also some fundamental flaws in corporate governance. The very simple version of, of, of explaining that is to say the following, which unfortunately I have also seen and have, to, have had to deal with. Uh, it takes about three to five years to totally destroy a bank. In the meantime, this bank is going to make huge profits. And if all that profit is extracted out of the bank when this is going on, in the form of, of bonuses or dividends, then there will be not enough money left when the markets go south. And that's not always either understood. And this is one of the reasons why people are arguing and discussing so much the whole issue of bonuses presently. 
because we are moving into a world where bonuses and other type of incentive systems are going to have to be structured in such a way that it, let's say it takes you five years before you get the money. Or you get the money, the bonus based on the five year average profit or something, something of that, something of that uh, type. But those newer systems that we, are, that we have to put together are pretty hard actually to, to, to construct. So intellectually, it's a fascinating topic in, in itself uh, to, to sort of think about how to, how to correct this. Gaps in the regulatory framework that, that created regulatory arbitrage. Uh, we, investment banks, uh, we know about that in this country. OTC derivatives are very opaque. They're hard to understand. And banks could expand off balance sheets. And there was too little focus on liquidity risk. And on that, uh, in addition to that, which is very hard to deal with, uh, su supervisors uh, tend to focus on bank by bank data. And it's very hard to catch macro systemic risk and fully understand the implications of macro systemic risks uh, getting out of hand. We just don't have the tools as of today to deal with that when it gets dangerous, not in an individual bank, but when it gets dangerous in the whole, in the whole system. And, and in some sense, it, 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 it's sort of like water. Because when you are boiling, when, when, when water heats up, all of a sudden when it reaches 100 degrees centigrade, uh, it turns into steam. And funny things happen exactly around that point. The same thing is with the financial system. Everything works fine under normal conditions, but then all of a sudden people think that this is not right, right anymore. And exactly when it reaches the peak and starts moving in the other direction, then funny things happen which are very hard to understand. So uh, what is it that has happened then? In addition to lowering interest rates, which a large number of central banks have, have done, and they have lowered interest rates to uniquely low levels. Uh, uh, they, they have uh, e uh, provided very large loans to the financial sector, which is highly, highly unusual. They have provided special liquidity assistance to individual institutions. And they have agreements on currency loans between countries. In, the, in our case, for example, we have a swap agreement with the Federal Reserve, a $30 billion swap agreement with the Federal Reserve. So we get the dollars from the Fed in New York, and then we lend them to our banks in our part of the, part of the world. Very, very important. Extended deposit guarantee systems of all sorts. And you have all sorts of government programs for putting money, capital into the, into the banks. And that on top of sort of the monetary policy being, being run with very, very low rates uh, presently. This is how the monetary policy normally functions. This is the transmission mechanism. But the problem with it is that it's run out of oil. So this is how we think about it in normal times. We have the interest rate channel. If interest rates go down, if you take, if you, uh, it becomes uh, cheaper to borrow. We have the credit channel through the banks. If the banks work properly, the businesses can turn to the banks and borrow money and, and invest. We have the exchange rate channel, which particularly holds if you have a floating exchange rate, because if interest rates go down, the exchange rate is likely to depreciate, at least in theory. And you can work off the inflation expectations as, as a way of sort of anchoring what's going on in the economy. But presently, financial markets are not functioning properly. So the transmission mechanism has become less effective. It doesn't work the way we used to know it. Uh, monetary policy and financial stability. This is really dealing with these two tasks simul simultaneously. Uh, because monetary policy, that's dealing with the policy rate and financial st stability. That's dealing with moral situation. That's telling the banks what they're supposed to do and inject liquidity in the system and a whole bunch of other things that you can, that you can do. Normally these tools are completely separate, but today that is not the case. One way uh, to illustrate this, and this is not more than just an illustration, is the following way to think about this. Let's say that IT is the policy interest rate set by the central bank. That's not going to be the lending rate that you as, let's say, mortgage holders meet. 
Because to that you have to eat, add an interest rate margin. And that, that interest rate margin is dependent on all sorts of going, things going on. Now for the sake of the argument, suppose that the policy rate goes to zero. That won't help you very much if at the same time M increases and in some cases almost to infinity. Because that means that the rate that the borrowers actually meet, the lending rate from the bank, banks, is still going to be very, very high regardless of what the central bank does. That's another way of, ex of explaining that the transmission mechanism doesn't work anymore. So, uh, what do you try to do? Well, then you move to what is called unconventional methods. Because if the normal way of doing business doesn't work anymore, you have to come up with something, something different. And basically what you try to do is to find different ways of making the financial markets work better. And you try in one way or the other to improve the supply of credit. This is, exact, this is what we do, this is what Bank of England does, this is what the ECB does, and this is also what the Fed does presently. One example is to, uh, to, sh to show this is what happened to our balance sheet in the course of the fall. And this is actually very similar to what has happened in a number of other countries. Normally, a central bank has assets, foreign exchange, domestic assets, uh, and lending. And on the liability side, you have banknotes and coins, bank deposits, and equity. If you measure the size of the balance sheet of the central banks relative to the size of the economy, these graphs show what, what happened uh, starting in July 08. Here you can see everything is sort of tugging along quite nicely. Nothing happens. 6% of GDP looks the same. All of a sudden, things start falling apart. Central banks start to lend. And, and you move up around 15 to 20% of GDP. And we have actually provided around 20% of GDP, which is, uh, which is actually quite, quite, quite high. And here you can see that it's not all that difference looking at the ECB, Bank of England, and the, and the Federal, Federal Reserve. Quite, quite similar. And that's because, in some sense, all these central banks have the same types of assets and li liabilities on their balance sheets. And that means, technically, you end up doing more or less the same thing, regardless of what it happens to be called in your own country. This is where we started. Forget about so, so much about the technical aspects of this. We started with a total of 192 billion. This is Kroner. It's about 20, 23 billion dollars. And then in a few months last fall, uh, things start going wrong in the financial sector and the balance sheet explodes to 700 billion. I think that this must be the fastest expansion of the balance sheet since 1668. So in that sense, this is a major, major event. I need to get some historian to actually check it so that I'm not wrong. And what is it, what happened? Look at the bold numbers here. Uh, lending in U.S. dollars, which was zero on the earlier slide, went all the way up to 196. Lending in Swedish kroner, 262. Uh, but then the nice thing about being a central bank is that when you provide, when you put more money in the system, all of it comes back at the end of the day, because people have no choice but either to come back to the central bank at the end of the day or put it in the mattress and then put the mattress in the vault. But if you, if you bring the money to the central bank, you are paid interest on it. And if you put it in the mattress, you don't, pay, you, you don't get interest payments. So this is, what, this is what happened. All this came back in, in the form of fine-tuning repo operations, our issuance of uh, 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 deposit certificates, and all this money that we borrowed from the, from the Fed. And this is just one example of what has happened in a number of central banks in various parts of the world. So what, 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 what is it then that we try to do and others? Well, we try to make the bank's assets, uh, access to means of payments easier, making it easier to get, get the money, try to increase the monetary base, which is defined as the bank's reserves in the central bank plus no, notes and coins. 
And in the case of the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England, they have taken further steps by buying assets outright in the market. Because the first two points, uh, bullets are actually dealing with, dealing with the banking sector. But the Fed and the BOE, they have actually started buying assets wherever they can find them in the market, in the form of all sorts of government bonds and also other types of, other types of assets. This is what happened to our monetary base. As you can see, it came tugging along for many for here. The red bars are basically notes and coins. And then all of a sudden, it jumps up to, jumps up to here. So it's a very, very sizable expansion <coughs> of our balance sheet. Credit easing, that's what the Federal Reserve does. They, they uh, purchase various types of financial assets. And they do so because they want, by doing so, they want to uh, reduce their, uh, the spreads in the market. And they want to make it easier for companies and whole households to gain access to credit, to keep the, whole, to keep the, system, keep the system going. And they have focused on the asset side of the balance, balance sheet. While well, Bank of England is doing another version of what is called quantitative easing because they buy government securities and they have focused on the liability, liability side of the balance sheet. Maybe this is sort of partly overstating the case, but this is just to, to come up with two different, different examples. And as I started out saying, in this case, instead of the price, the policy rate, it's the quantity that, that the that these central banks are dealing with because the monetary base is affected uh, directly. And that's, of course, how you have to do it if the interest rate, if the policy rate gets down to zero or very close to zero because from then on there's not much you can do on the interest rate side. So then you have to move from price to quantity instead. One way of describing this <coughs> is to argue about this in terms of what is called the quantity equation. It's very simple. This is what people talked about 100 years ago uh, when they discussed macro. So somebody sitting here then would have recognized this. Basically what this is saying is that money supply times the velocity of money equals nom uh, the price level times uh, real GDP. And another way of explaining what is happening presently in the economy is to say the following, that if velocity goes down because people are holding on to their money, because that's exactly what has been going on, then money supply has, go, has to go up for nominal GDP to stay constant. And that's what this is all about. Because if, just for the sake of the argument, suppose that the money supply instead went down and also velocity goes down, then the price level would start to fall and eventually probably also re real GDP would fall. And when the price level starts falling, that's deflation. And that's dangerous and very, very difficult to get out of. And this is why central banks now have moved into a territory where you actually work on M. In one, in one way or the other, in order to keep the economy uh, going as best as we can. So credit easing, uh, this is, all of this is uh, new to most uh, central banks. Part of it is most of us have never done this uh, before. Uh, and so one needs to be sort of careful and we have to pr pretty much uh, see what, what happens. And, and whether these actually measures uh, will work or not. So there's an element of, of trial, trial and error in this uh, because this is so unusual, uh, but still our job is to make sure that uh, in our case that we meet our inflation target 2% and that means that if this is what we have to do, then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do it. So far, we have not had to start increasing the money supply by buying, let's say, government bonds, uh, but uh, and, in this, uh, and, and in this case, both our inflation target, because the inflation target anchors uh, inflation expectations, and our floating exchange rate has been uh, something that has been very, very helpful for, 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 for us. Uh, but we are ready as to do what is necessary when it is necessary if, 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 if we feel that we need to do, do that. Let me say a few things about how to also avoid crisis in the future. Uh, 
One issue that has been discussed a lot is bubbles. Is it possible for central banks to print bubbles or not and, and do it in advance? This will be discussed uh, for a long, long time to come, but I do think that it will be more important in the future than in the past uh, for central banks to keep track of, tr track of this. And for a very, very simple reason. If you end up with a bubble the type that we have ended up now, many, many will learn the hard way that in real economy terms, it is very, very costly to get out of it once the bubble has burst. So if one can come up with techniques uh, to control the economy in such a way that we can avoid bubbles, that's so bad. Oh, I'll skip that one. This is very simple. Again, a little bit of math. Knut Vixell, he's actually a Swedish economy, economist who argued about these things about 100 years ago. Most of what he wrote was written in German, so nobody could understand what he wrote. And then it was translated many, many years later. But basically what he said, this is, the, by the way, the guy who talked about the natural rate of interest, which is very close to what is called the real rate of interest. Basically he said if in, in the inflation rate goes up, then price, uh, the interest rate has to go up. The modern version of this is a Taylor equation, which is basically saying that the policy rate of interest is the inflation rate plus the real interest rate. Uh, plus two terms, one dealing, one dealing with the, uh, the, inflation, uh, the target inflation rate and how you deviate from that, plus uh, the output gap uh, uh, expressed here as yt minus y bar. And as if you read the newspapers, it said the other day that when the, the Fed minutes in this country were published uh, recently, they argued that, uh, uh, that uh, the output gap should be minus 5%. That, mean, that, that means that this, this term would have then been, in that world, negative if you use a Taylor equation, which is what they were act actually talking about. Now, uh, this is monetary policy. Now, think about something similar, a Taylor equation for capital adequacy. How much money actually, how much equity capital you actually have to have in a bank. Uh, one way of explaining this is to say the following, that this is the desired level of loan portfolios or the desired increase, if you want, of loan portfolios in the financial sector. And this is the output gap. But this thing then says that if L is very large, then capital adequacy CT goes up. You have to put in more equity capital in the banks. When that happens, it gets more expensive for the banks to lend because the equity holders want to get their dividends. And then, given that it gets more expensive to lend, the supply of loans is, is going to go down because it gets more expensive to borrow, and, and, and uh, the whole thing doesn't run, uh, run amok. Same thing if you look at this term. If you are way above average growth, then things are moving too fast in the economy, and you say capital adequacy is going to have to go up one way, one way or the other. So, if you add that term, here's the policy rate, and here's the capital adequacy requirement, and this is the interest rate margin, and this, this is the link between monetary policy and financial stability. This is how you can make these two things sort of visually go hand in hand. But keep in mind then that on my side, this is just to illustrate this phenomenon. One needs to do a ton of work to actually make this operational. And we are far, far from having, having done, done that. N in normal times, you don't care about CT. But now times are not normal. And if we want to avoid this in the future, we're going to have to think about it in, the, in these terms. Technically, how this will be solved and how it actually will, will evolve over time, I don't know. Uh, but th this is at least one way of sort of thinking about what we have to do and what lies ahead. So concluding ref re reflections, financial crises are nothing new. The Riggs Bank came out of a financial crisis 1668, so there is nothing new under the sun. Under the, sun. Uh, this, the scope and the complexity of this crisis uh, makes it more serious than previous ones. And deglobalization, which is a lecture all in itself, is very, very dangerous. 
and can hurt the whole world economy if we cannot turn this around quickly. And here I'm talking about not deglobalization of trade. I'm talking about deglobalization of financial transactions, which is dangerous in itself. But it's even more dangerous if, you, if we were to end up with deglobalization of trade. And we must find the tools to attain a more balanced development in the, in the future. So, I have talked continuously for an hour. I have scratched a little bit on the surface. Uh, this is stuff that I have the great, great privilege of uh, dealing with uh, on a daily basis. I never expected to do so because I sat behind desk like you do here too and thought about this uh, when I studied it, the way you sort of think about it for the fun of it because I sort of felt that this was kind of like studying chess rules and I liked it. I never really expected uh, end up ending up doing this but now I actually do and it's a great, great privilege to have that right to do so and it's also at least on my side has been truly, truly enjoyable to talk to you uh, given that that's how I started out long ago. So, thank you. We do have time for questions. And I think because it's being filmed, you have to speak into a mic. So, as you have questions, I'll run up and give them to you. Those of you who have exams or whatever, um, please let them file out quietly. Even easier, why don't you, if you have questions, why don't you come up, and have, instead of having me run around, come up and speak into the microphone. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. So uh, I just wanted to get your take on the, uh, what happened in Iceland and with uh, what happened with Kopting, Glitnir, and Lance Banky, and your take on that. <coughs> Okay, what happened in Iceland is that one of, the, one of the consequences of globalization is that today we have uh, created a system where you can grow your banking sector or financial sector into any size, also cross-border. But we don't have good rules for making it shrink once it has outgrown the size of your own economy. In the case of Iceland, this thing might, maybe might have worked provided that the rest of the world would have stayed stable. Now in Iceland, they ended up with what one could call the perfect storm, because the rest of the world ended up very unstable, while they at the same time had uh, taken extreme risks. And Iceland was simply too small an economy to back up their banks. Uh, so basically what, they, what happened was that they ended up, which is most unfortunate for those people there, uh, with an implosion of the whole financial sector and they are still suffering from that and they will suffer for years to come when they now have to sort out this mess and there's not enough money to go around. Yeah, thanks. I have one question about your earlier comment having to do with it taking three to five years to ruin a bank. Mm -hmm. um, could you just uh, maybe tell a couple of anecdotes or, or, or fill out the story? I think a lot of people uh, that raise a few eyebrows um, and a lot of people are paying attention to it, of course, here in the U.S. with all the talk about bonuses and whatnot. But in, in okay. the past, has it been generally bonuses or dividends or how did it play out? And if, could you give us a couple of examples? Sure. Let's assume that you have a, not a first tier, but a kind of a second tier bank. And then these guys decide that we're going to become a first tier bank. So we're going to have to expand our loan portfolio very, very quickly. Suppose that you expand your loan portfolio so that it doubles every year. If it increases with that rapidity, it's quite likely that you do not fully understand to whom you lend. But you understand a it, it's, but, but no one is completely ignorant so that you normally you never lend to people who default on their first payment. 
it takes a while until they actually default. But during the expansionary phase, if, if the stock of loans just increases and increases, you're going to have a large enough number of new borrowers in there who are actually paying in the early days. And as if through a miracle in the short run, then you appear to make an enormous profit. And then you are considered to be a star. But then when the market goes south, and all of a sudden people stop paying, given that the first year banks have done this in many, many parts of the world for a hundred years or longer than that, they have already picked all the good customers. So you as a second tier bank with a wish to expand, exposed, realized when it's too late that you only ended up with the not so good customers. But since you're making a profit and a huge profit in the meantime, then you can pay out all these dividends and bonuses and, 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 and what, what not. And that's what I meant when I said that this is why it takes three to five years actually to, to destroy, de destroy a bank. Another version of this is very, very simple, is to say that Old-fashioned bankers used to say that you should, you should never lend to people beyond what you can see from the church tower. Because them you know, but not those other ones. So if you move too far too quickly, and uh, you can translate this into all the new fancy instruments, then that's what you get. Banks like Citigroup and Bank of America really second-tier banks? No, I, I was just giving one example because this also holds if you start moving into all sorts of new businesses that you have not done, not done in the past. So it's, it, it's also a general statement when it comes to, say, options, futures, forwards, all sorts of new types of, of uh, instruments. One basically has to be, has to be careful. Uh, so you mentioned a little bit bonuses. Um, it's a relatively unique compensation structure in the financial industry. Large portions of people's income come in the form of bonuses, which is quite different from most other industries, which is in part, I suppose, a way of coping with a greater degree of uncertainty in the sector. Um, could you talk about alternative incentive structures um, that might be part of a sort of productive conversation about how to alter bonuses? Because in a lot of ways in the United States, the conversation has become essentially a class conflict conversation, which is not as productive about discussing sort of alternative incentive structures beyond the bonus structure we have now. Or, uh, maybe to oversimplify, I, I think that one, one has to start thinking about bonus structures such that they, you, these systems simply move slower than in the past. If you combine my example which is sort of overstressing the point that it takes three to five years to destroy a bank, it should basically take more than five years before you're allowed to cash in your bonus. Because maybe there was nothing there. But how you actually technically construct those systems in a wise way, uh, I can't tell. Because I struggle with the inflation target and the rest of it, so I'm not in that part of the business. Thank you very much for your very insightful uh, speech. And uh, I'm sure you have been asked this question many times, but uh, what is your view about the Swedish way to solve the banking crisis versus the US way so far? And the other question is about your, because you were at the IMF uh, for a certain period of time, do you think the IMF in this moment is going to be able to help certain countries or not? Well, on the first issue, the simple answer about, is, is about, about the Swedish model is that since I did it and I survived, <laughs> it was, but it's not as simple as that. Because one way of talking about it is to say that actually what was Swedish about the model was how we put the pieces together. But basically, a good number of people who helped us actually came from London and New York. 
And many of the tools that we used had been used before in other countries, in this country, for, for example. Uh, what mar what, where we were quite successful was actually in the execution. Because how you technically do these things and how you kind of, th that is well known and it's essentially corporate finance. It's a very straight, it's an unusual aspect of corporate finance because when you go to business school, basically you only study successful cases. You never go to business school and study disasters. But this is really being in the disaster business. But, but the objective function is the same, to, to, to maximize the profit, which normally in these circumstances is to minimize the loss. Uh, then your question about how, how does one compare? I really wouldn't want to do that because we're really talking about uh, size differences here. And we're also talking about different, different, different political systems. Uh, which put certain constraints on how you actually execute things. I do think, though, that when this episode is over, you'll find that many of the bits and pieces in this uh, were also more or less, more or less the same. But it's, it's, it's too early to tell how it, how it will uh, evolve, because in some respects, these things are the same, but then in other respects, countries are different. To what extent the IMF will help countries? Yes. Uh, given that the IMF is also getting more and more financing compared to what they have had in the past, given that they already have done uh, a fairly large number of new programs, uh, and given where the world is going in terms of negative growth in a huge number of, huge number of countries, it is highly, highly likely that this is continue, going to continue. Stefan, while I walk across the room, could you tell people briefly what happened during the early 1990s during the Swe for Swedish banking crisis? Okay, uh, what happened was that first of all we started out with a very sizable macroeconomic disequilibrium due to two lax fiscal policies. Uh, we had had uh, a fixed exchange rate for a long time, an inflation rate which was not commensurate with that fixed exchange rate, and we had had all sorts of uh, uh, regulations in place uh, exchange controls, uh, loan ceilings, interest rate, rate ceilings, sort of things similar to, if those, those of you who, who have studied this in this country, similar to regulation Q and, and, and things like that. Uh, this created a huge disequilibrium and a huge bubble in the real estate market. In the greater Stockholm region, I think prices went up between 1980 to 1990 with almost a by almost a thousand percent. So everything you touch turned into gold if you were early. In 12 to 18 months, prices fell by 40 to 60 percent. When that happened, 85 percent of the banking sector during one period when I was director general of the Bank Support Authority reported to me. So it was truly, truly a systemic event. What we then had to do was to clean up this mess and the way we did it was to create a, a system where we divided banks into three categories. Banks with a capital adequacy level above 8%, they could do whatever they wanted. We never dealt with them. Banks between 2 and, zero, uh, two and 8%, there we had to negotiate with the private sector in one way or the other how to come to a conclusion and how to put in more capital. And then a bit below 2% and below zero, we just took over the banks because they were gone. To get to this point, we created a system with very serious stress testing and with very serious scenario work and we created a huge database uh, so that we could run these scenarios when the banks were recapitalized, uh, making them sort of stay alive for at least another three years. And then given that the exchange rate peg uh, just went out the window, and given that interest rates came down, and during one period, actually, the policy rate went up to 500%. And if you stay at that level, almost everything has a problem. <laughs> uh, so based on all of this, we did all this restructuring work, and the bank, the, the, those banks that were in deep, deep trouble, we basically split them in two parts, a good bank and a bad bank, where all the bad assets ended up. And then after a few years, all the bad assets were sold into the market and, and sort of things uh, uh, came, came back in a fairly, fairly orderly, orderly way. But that's, that's really, really the sort of the two-minute version of this. 
It's many, many years of hard work to actually make it, make it happen. Uh, thank you for coming to talk. Um, you had mentioned a lot of a variety of reasons why we're in the current crisis. We have, how substantial a role do you think that uh, AIG played in all of that? AIG? Yeah. Very difficult for me to tell because to, to, to actually opine on that, one would have needed to be present in this country. And then one would have needed to be there those nights when you actually had to decide. And because these are tricky things to do. Almost by definition, when these things happen, you have very limited information. Because if you had a ton of information, somebody else would have fixed the problem earlier. Uh, but the AIG issue is something about risks moving out of the banks into the insurance sector in such a way that it wasn't fully understood the degree of leverage that this created in the system. And that became an issue in itself. And, and, and this is probably the reason why AIG needed some special treatment, so to speak, so that, so that you wouldn't have uh, spread effects in the, whole, in, in the whole system. But I truly don't, I'm truly not familiar with the technical details, so it's hard for me to sort of opine on it. But it, given the size of the AIG and, 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 and given how they were interconnected with the rest of the financial system, this is probably what they had to do in order to save the system. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, why, uh, for example, is the Fed so secretive, and what are the arguments against uh, transparency in central banks? Well, it's up to the Fed to to answer to answer that. Uh, one can argue this both ways. I have argued it my way. The counter argument is to say that if you want to have a free debate within the institution. Uh, if you are a little bit more held back when it comes to transparency, then, then it, will, it will be easier for people to speak their minds. But the jury is still out which way, which way one should go. Uh, I'm sorry. Hmm? I'll, I'll get to you. Hi, welcome to Duke. I hope you're enjoying the heat. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned the idea of having a sort of good bank and bad bank in the Swedish crisis, uh, mm -hmm. a bad bank that could buy up assets and then I mm -hmm. guess resell them on the market. Mm -hmm. And that idea has been proposed. Um, do you think that idea would work in America during the current financial crisis, as in, I guess, having a bank that could buy up toxic access, uh, assets, value them in some way, and then resell them to the market? or? Where are the pros and cons of that? All right, uh, this can be done in many different ways, and, and, and it's just time doesn't really allow for me to fully answer that, answer that question. So just let me explain how we thought about it. We, in the end, all banks, all major banks in the Swedish economy decided to set up their own bad banks, one way or the other. Also, those banks where the government was never involved in that exercise. Because one way or the other, banks came to the conclusion that you needed to treat bad assets in a way different from good assets. To overstate the point, because banker, good bankers in the good bank want to keep their customers. Bad banking is about to get rid of your customers. So the mindset you have to have to run a bad bank is completely different to the mindset you need to have to run a good bank. And that holds regardless of whether the government is involved or not. In our case, after endless discussions, we decided never to buy bad assets from the private sector. We only dealt with bad banks in banks that we controlled 100% ourselves. Because we could never agree on the price. And the process was sort of simple. You have a banker coming up to me and he says, I have these wonderful bad assets that I want to sell to you at a high price. And I said, since I'm the only buyer, I decide the price and it's not worth very much. And we, so we could never agree on these transactions where you sort of craw, make a crossover from one part of the economy to the other. So we only ran bad banks. <laughs> Uh, uh, 
in those two cases when, when the bank support authority owned the bank and controlled the process completely. But that doesn't mean that that's the only way to do it. Uh, you can come up with all sorts of arguments also for doing it different ways. And, and uh, the jury is still out. It's too early to tell in this country. We just don't know because it's early in the, early in the process. So did you just allow the, uh, the defaults and foreclosures to happen? In the corporate, there a lot of bankruptcy? yes, in the corporate sector, yes. How about in the private sector? In in the corporate, in um, among the corporates, but this never really hit the household sector, and that's because we have a legal system which is quite different compared to the foreclosure system that you have here. Because if you have ne negative equity on your house, that doesn't mean that you can walk away from your debt. And that means that in that environment, the debt stays with you more or less forever, or you have to go to court and negotiate. And if you negotiate successfully, they put you on five years of subsistence before you are free from your debt. And in that environment, it just doesn't pay to walk away from your house. So that's one issue. The other issue is that in, a, in, a, in an environment where the social safety net is different because the unemployment benefits are different because you have a healthcare system which is different and so on. It's more likely that um, that a household can maintain a cash flow such that uh, they can service their debt. And at least in in our environment, the last thing households did was to stop paying their mortgages. They, I mean, they really were try hard to 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 pay off every deal with stop paying your credit cards, all sorts of other things, but just really try to do that. And that's because people know that if I don't pay, that doesn't mean that the debt disappears. So in that sense, it's a very, it's a different, it's a different type of systems with different types of uh, incentives, uh, which makes it uh, quite, quite different. However, on the corporate sector side, there were tons and tons of bankruptcies. And on the corporate sector side, we have huge issues with seizing collateral, ending up owning buildings and, and owning what not, golf courses where the sun never shines in other parts of the world, and, and, and helicopter companies in Africa, and all sorts of weird things. We had John Lennon's guitar, I think, as collateral in a vault in London. And, 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 and that, when, that was sort of when you began realizing that this is not banking anymore. This is something completely different. How is uh, the United States government dealing with our crisis? How does it compare with what you did in the 90s, and do you think it's going to be successful? I just don't want to compare because of, because of the size. We're talking about a continent, and we're talking about a different type of system, and we're talking about also a different type of political, political system. I, I just want to limit myself to say that ex post in the future, many of the bits and pieces are, 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 are the same. And for one simple reason, here in this country, I mean, when the first bank went under, uh, I had, we had to go all the way back to 1905 uh, to understand what had happened in the past. So there was no one around who knew where to start. And I was clueless myself. I just came walking down the corridor in the finance ministry when all this started happening. In this country, the FDIC, they've been doing this since the 1930s. So, so there, in, in terms of the technical skills and how you actually do these things, there's plenty of people, plenty of people around, and, and the problems will be fixed in this country too. Thanks for coming and talking to us today. Um, obviously, we've seen the negative side of derivatives with what happened to AIG. Do you think there's a positive side for derivatives, like what Alan Greenspan originally envisioned with them, as far as him saying that they're they're great, they're going to spread around risk, and there will be no more risk eventually, but. Do you, do you think that anything close to that scenario could happen? Or do you think they're purely a bad idea? No, I used to be head of an options exchange. Yeah. Charles didn't say that. <laughs> so I started out in the options business a long time ago. And, 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 and uh, based on that, I do think that derivatives are not dangerous in themselves. Derivatives are just one way of dealing with risk, but when in doing so, one has to be very careful how you actually go about doing it. And that's really the part that needs, uh, needs more, more, more focus. Because if you get into derivatives, you need to understand how they operate. You need to understand the enormous leverage that you can create out of, 
out of using, using derivatives. Uh, you need to, to fully understand how these instruments actually operate. This time it's obvious ex post that all the people involved in this did not understand that. In my country, I have dealt with the derivative messes myself in the past for exactly the same reasons. So in that sense, there's nothing, there's nothing new, in the, new in the sun, under, under the sun. But when things just go up, 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 then you don't have to be all that sophisticated. It gets hard when things go down, down, down. That's, that's the hard part of it. Then you need to, need, need to be, need to be mindful, mindful of that. I do think that we're going to end up with more uh, clearinghouse cleared derivatives and more exchange traded derivatives in the past. Because to do OTC derivatives, is, is, then, then it, it's really hard to disentangle and fully understand what is, what, what is going on. So personally, I'm in favor of, of more exchange traded derivatives and, and more uh, clearinghouse cleared derivatives. Because then at least it's easier to, to fully to, to understand what's happening. Coming. Do you think that the fact that the Swedish bank is independent from the government makes it easier to pursue inflation targeting because there isn't as much pressure to decrease unemployment? Yes. Definitely. So would the U.S. be able to follow a similar inflation targeting? Problem? Well, this is, I mean, when it comes to central banking, it's in many, many countries, it's a very hotly debated issue what the central bank law is supposed to look like. And that's not something that you change once every five years. So once you, you sort of need to operate within the system that you have. When, when you think about what the Fed actually does, they, they don't seem to be all that far from eventually using sort of inflation targeting, but maybe without doing it in, 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 the, most, uh, in the most formal way. The way it works when I... When we, when, when I, when we uh, change the rate of interest is, is, is that, as far as I can judge, there's, there's been no political pressure on me as an individual. No pol politician has called me saying, I want you to do that. Because that's illegal. And it's in, <laughs> and it's in the law. Because there is a ban on seeking instruction, so I'm not allowed either to go to a, to a minister and say, what do you want me to do? Because that's also illegal. And there is also a ban on giving instruction. And we're careful about that. So the way it works is that we decide, the six of us, and then uh, it's my job to sometime in the course of the day to go and call the minister, and I do. And normally it's a five minute phone call when I say we did, a, we did this and he, we sort of, and I explain what the reasons were for, uh, for, for, for doing, doing that. But that's how we do it in many other countries. It, it works in a completely different, completely different way. With that, I'm afraid we need to break, come to a close. Um, I want to thank again Stefan Ingves for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.